Well, welcome church and happy new year. It is so good to be with you today. I did, wasn't here on the first week of the year. Thanks to John Emmert for kicking off the new year in such a grand fashion. But it is great to be with you today. And I'm really excited about the new sermon series that kicks off this week to sort of launch our year. This is your story. We're going to talk about 150 years of First Christian Church. Uh, but before we jump into that, uh, in light of this week, I want to just I want to give you a couple reminders, and then I want to pray together. I expect I'm not the only one who has found this a hard week. Uh, really, the last time I watched the news, as much as I have this week, uh, was 9/11. That was the last time that I just stayed stuck to my television as much as I have been this week. Um, I'm actually not sure it was super healthy for me either time. There wasn't much I could do, but somehow I found it hard to pull away. So I thought before we jumped into the message and launched the series, I just would uh, share with you a couple reminders. Um, some of these I had to be reminded of. Uh, we had an elders meeting Thursday night, and we, we prayed for our country for a long time as we started off. And boy, I tell you, I was listening to the prayers of our elders. And at one point, I started taking notes while I was praying because I didn't want to forget the prayer because I needed to be reminded. So here are a couple reminders for you. I, I call them reminders because they, they're things you probably already know or you've been told before, but maybe it'd be helpful for you to remember right now. So the first reminder is about faith. Our faith is in God. That is our rock. That is the, the steady anchor. Not in presidents, which come and go, or governments, which also come and go. Not as often as presidents, but they do. They rise and fall. You can't point to a nation on earth that was here when Jesus was here. Our faith is not in politics. Our faith is in God. And I've needed to be reminded of that several times this week. The second reminder is about anger. Anger by itself isn't all that bad a thing. Some things should make us angry. Injustice should make us angry. Cruelty should make us angry. But I, I've been struggling with my anger this week. Because anger can make us do a lot of things that are bad things. The anger might not be that bad. Maybe the anger is justified. But anger makes it easy to excuse hatred, and cruelty. Anger makes it easy to excuse lying. God's word says it's not a sin to be angry, but in your anger, do not sin. So I would just challenge you. Man, on the days when you read some news article and it makes you angry, don't let your anger tempt you into hating some other person. Okay, Paul says our struggle is not with flesh and blood. That means no person is ever your enemy. I know, you want to tell me the person you think is the exception. I probably think they're the exception too. And I, I'm, I'm telling you this because I struggled with this this week. I, I'm struggling with it this morning. But if they're a human being, they're not your enemy. That's what Paul says. I says. Paul says our enemy is the devil. And I still believe in the devil. And I think we are in a, I would say, a demonic opportunity. An opportunity for Satan to turn your heart away from God and into anger and cruelty and rage. So I would just remind you, don't let that happen. In your anger, do not sin. Don't believe every Facebook post you read. And don't forward a Facebook post that you haven't independently verified. There's so much falsehood out there. Decide that you will resist the way that anger wants to lead us into sin. Say, I'm going to stand against. And, and it's a little different for all of us, right? You know? I guess it was Thursday afternoon in a perfectly normal conversation with my kids. I snapped at them. And like they were going to look super confused. And they're like, why would you get mad at me? And I answered, 
because there was a riot in Washington yesterday and I stayed up all night watching the news and I'm so I'm mad and I can't take it out on the rioters, so I took it out on you. Like that's why I got mad at him. That was it. That was the reason. So in your anger, do not sin. My third reminder would be this. And it's, this is the worst one, but it's straight from Jesus. Love your enemies. And pray for those who persecute you. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. If your strategy for getting through this trying time is to go hang out on social media with people that think like you and agree with you and talk like you and hate the same people you hate, you are disobeying Jesus. If that's how you're going to get through this, is to go to the news site where they already say the things you agree with and you go to the comment section and they, they bash the people you don't like and they, they cheer on the people you do like. If that's your strategy, you are disobeying Jesus. Because Jesus says, love your enemies. Actively seek out those you disagree with, those that oppose you. Track them down so that you can love them. And doggone it, I really believe if just those who called on the name of Jesus Christ as their Lord, if just those people in our country went and found their political opponents and loved them, we will, this will be over so fast, it will just be done. If just the people who call on Jesus just decided to love their enemies with urgency, and power, and strength. Would we get wounded? Of course we would get wounded. Jesus died on a cross. Like the path of love is not a path of easy. I'm not saying they'll love you back every time. I'm not saying it'll be easy. or will all sing kumbaya. But I am saying that the cause of Christ would be promoted if we would just love our enemies. Those three reminders, you already knew them. And I really, there is a chance that the only person in here who needs these reminders is me, because I have struggled to put my faith in God alone as I've watched the institutions of our world get shaky. And I have struggled when I have gotten angry to avoid sin. And so I needed that reminder. And I struggle to actively love my enemies. So I know I needed those three reminders, and maybe they're useful for somebody else too. The main thing, though, I need and you need And we all need is to pray. And so maybe you'd join me in that right now. Father God, we turn to you today as our shepherd, our leader, our God, and our Savior. And we thank you that you are a rock. That you are are a steady, saving God. That you are reliable and steadfast and faithful and good when everything else is corrupted and shaky and unreliable. And God, we call out to you now with hearts that are bursting. So much stuff we can't keep track of. Emotional world that is off the page. We're afraid and angry and nervous and worried and we cry out to you on behalf of our nation and our families and our own hearts because we need you God God we pray for those who are scared that they would know that you are not scared you are mighty to save, strong and secure and in control. We pray as those who are shocked, but we know, God, that you are not surprised. You are not caught off guard. But in every situation, you, God, are ready. We pray as those who are weeping. So comfort us in our sadness. 
We pray as those who are angry. And so, God, I just pray that in our anger, God, protect us from sin. God, I just, I, as a people, we come to you with our anger and cast our cares and frustrations on you. For there is injustice and upheaval and chaos in our world. God, help us. Help us to learn how to love even when we're angry. How to pray even when we're worried. How to be productive and peaceful and be a force of healing in our world. God, we come to you in a world that is divided. And we ask that in this place, there might be unity. Not because we agree on politics or the election or everything else, but because we agree on Jesus Christ and we know that our foundation is there and nowhere else. Lord, make us instruments of your peace. Where there is hatred, let us so love. Where there is injury, may we bring pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. Oh, Jesus Christ who looked not to your own satisfaction, but sacrificed yourself for the sake of those you loved, grant us the same spirit, that we would not seek to be consoled ourselves, but instead seek to console others. That we would not seek to be understood, but instead seek to understand. That we would not insist that we would be loved, but instead work to love others. Give us the way of Christ in this. In all of this we pray. In the name of the one who was and is and is to come. Our only true Lord, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, when things get crazy, it is good to be part of a church that's 150 years old. Because that's a church that's seen some stuff, that's been through some stuff. And it gives me confidence to know that if we made it through that, we'll make it through this. And if you're here with us today, uh, here in the room or online or watching this later on your cell phone... You are part of that story. Have you heard the news? This is the year that we celebrate our 150th birthday. It's called a sesquicentennial, which is harder to say than you think it is. It really, try it sometime. And this year, we are going to celebrate. Off and on, for the whole year, you'll find that we're going to stop and celebrate 150 years of God's faithfulness through this one local church. And today, we, we kick off a brand new series telling just a little bit of our story. Your story. The story of First Christian Church in Johnson City. Uh, the, the story starts on November 12th, 18. 71. The very first document produced by our church uh, began on that first day of existence, November 12th, 1871, when around 15 people gathered in the home of William H. Young. The house still exists. It's over on Cedar Place. I won't give the address right now so we don't all drive right there and freak out the owners, but it's still, people still live there. Same house. 15 people gathered there. And about that day, in the days after, they wrote the following document, the oldest document of our church. The Christian Church of Johnson City was organized 
on the 12th day of November, in the year of our Lord, 1871. The following named brethren and sisters were first enrolled and agreed to be steadfast in the apostles' teaching and fellowship and in the breaking of bread and prayers. And this agreement includes all others that may be added thereafter, the Lord permitting them so to live. And after that, we have a, a list of names. It starts with the, the, the 15 that were there that very first day. And then more and more names were added. In 1885, uh, the names were so many, they filled both sides of that sheet of paper. And that sheet of paper was uh, abandoned and replaced with a, a formal book of members in the church. But it all started on, on that little sheet of paper. 15 people who agreed to be steadfast in the apostles' teaching, fellowship, the breaking of bread, and prayers. And then they said, this agreement includes all others that may be added thereafter, the Lord permitting them so to live. That's how the story starts. And this is your story. You're going to hear that phrase a lot this year. This is your story. In part, you'll just hear it because it's true. And some of you already know that it's true, right? Like, some of you have been in this church or connected to it for generations. You can tell me what your grandpa did at this church, or your great-grandpa did at this church, or your great-great-grandpa did at this church. And if that's the case, you already knew that the story of this church was your story. But maybe it's your first time here. Maybe a friend sent you a link and you're watching online for the very first time or you're, you're sitting down in your PJs and you've been coming for a month or two, but you've never even seen the building. Well, here's what you need to know. It's still your story. It's your story because this story, the story of this church and God's faithfulness through it is your legacy. When you join in with us, it becomes your inheritance. And you know it's your story because you, did you hear that? The very first thing they wrote down way back in 1871, from the very beginning, they knew that the story of this church would belong to others. I love that. They said, this church, the 15 of us, and everybody who any time after this shows up and says, yeah, I'll, I'll live that way too. I'm going to jump in with that. That sounds pretty good to me. I'm on board with that. And they said, it's going to be your story too. The story of this church, which we'll be telling throughout the year, is also your story in one other important way. It's your story not just to inherit, to remember. It's also your story to write. That's part of what's great about telling the story of a church is that it's not done being written. I mean, 150 years of our story are written, and we'll get to remember some of that and Talk about some of the highlights. But next year's story hasn't been written. This year's story hasn't been written. Next decade's story, there's so much more of our story. I mean, as long as Jesus tarries, we've got more story to write. And you get to help write that story. I hope you will. I can't wait to see what the next chapter says. But today, before we talk too much about this truth, the truth that the story of this church is our story and it is your story, whether it's your first day here or you've been coming here since you're born. Before we talk about the fact that the story of this church is your story, I need to say something even more foundational, something that lies beneath that truth. Because the story of this church, of every church, even before it is your story, it is God's story. You see, the story of the church always is the story of God and Jesus Christ. Because the church belongs to Jesus. It doesn't belong to us. We say that sometimes, right? That's my church. This is my church. Don't you mess with my church. And I get what we mean by the phrase, but technically it's inaccurate. 
It's Christ's church. Matthew 16, when the disciples are just starting to figure out who Jesus is, uh, Jesus asks them one day, he says, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, others say Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And then he turns on him, he says, but what about you? Who do you say that I am? And Peter gives the confession that we still use today. When people want to join the church, this is the confession we ask them to make. Because this is what makes us members of one church. Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus says, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jodah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock... I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Did you hear Jesus say it? On this rock, on the word of your confession that I am the Christ, the Son of the living God, I will build, Jesus says, my church. And the Bible keeps telling us this truth. Ephesians 1.22 God says, God placed everything under Christ's feet and appointed Christ to be the head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. This teaching shows up in dozens of texts, that the church is the body of Christ. And Christ is the head of the church. The church is that physical representation that emanates out of the lordship and sovereignty of Christ. You've got ten people who agree that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God, and they agree together you've got a church. The church is when the people embody the lordship of Christ in their lived out rhythm. That's a church and it belongs to Jesus because it's the body of Christ. The church preaches Christ. The church is founded by Christ. The church is sustained by Christ. The church is the body of Christ. And when the church becomes anything else, well, it sort of becomes a monster. Like if the church ever becomes about anything else other than the lordship of Christ over our collected lives, Well, it's like that old, you know, creepy monster from some B-movie of some headless zombie, right? You know? And that does happen, right? Churches can lose their heads, so to speak. And and I don't want to depress you about all the ways that a church can go wrong, but but it does happen, and we've got to be guarded about it, right? A, A church can become about politics. On the left or the right, we've seen that happen to churches, where that's what they're mainly about, is getting their political point across. A church can become about a person. Sometimes pastors try to take over churches. Or a church can become about a family. Or churches can become about legalism or morality or fighting moral corruption. Churches can become about their own traditions. You know, kind of that's what they're about, is what they, their traditions are. Churches can become about their own liturgies, or about our music, or about our worship, or about our ceremonies. There are lots of ways churches can get it wrong. But when we get it right, churches are about one thing. They're about Jesus. We are the collection of people who together believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and together decide to organize our lives under Christ's lordship. And when we remember that the church is for Jesus Christ and about Jesus Christ, and especially, I just this is so helpful, when we remember that the church belongs to Jesus, well, it just changes everything about how we face the future of the church. People ask me, you know, it's a crazy time. People will say, Ethan, do you have hope for the church? And I'll say, well, why do you ask? And they'll have some statistic. Maybe it'll be about declining attendance or about this or about some cultural shift. And you know, In light of all this, Ethan, do you have any hope for the church? 
And I'll say, well, in light of that, no, I have no hope for the church. But that's not how I decide whether or not I have hope for the church. I have hope for the church because the church belongs to Jesus, and Jesus said the gates of hell will not prevail against it. That's the only reason I have hope for the church. As far as I can tell, it's the only reason anyone could ever have hope for the church. I mean, pastors, they're a mixed bag, but most of us have no idea what we're doing. You know? And the people who go to churches, they're not much better than the pastors. I mean, obviously they're a little better than the pastors, but not much. How could you have confidence in the church? Well, you could have confidence in the church if Jesus says, this belongs to me, and I will protect it, and the church will prevail. Knowing that the church belongs to Jesus gives me great peace in hard times. Great peace had a pastor I worked with once, his name was Tom Moen. He taught me a little trick. Holy mackerel. Taught this to me more than 10 years ago. It has helped me so much. At the end of a bad day, when you've worked really hard, and there's more work to do at the end of the day than there was at the beginning of the day, as he was leaving his office, he would say out loud, as if to the sky, but really as it was a prayer, he would say, all right, Jesus, It's your church. You're going to have to fix it because I sure messed it up. Or something like that. All right, Jesus, I did all I could. You'll have to take it from here. I don't know what I'm doing. And and hearing him say that day after day, it just, it changed my heart. Yeah, it's Jesus' church. And he will sustain it. And this gives me peace in hard times. On the flip side, though, knowing that the church belongs to Christ will also give us humility in good times. Acts 2.47 uh, describes a great little moment in the life of the church when they were growing and caring for one another. It's, it's from the same text where that, that phrase, the apostles teaching fellowship, breaking the bread and prayer came from that was in that little history snippet I read. And in Acts 2.47, at the end of that description of this great season of the life of the church, it says, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. The Lord added to their number. When things are going bad, God's got it. And when things go well, God did it. Like, this, just, just, just. Hear that again, because I know it's so simple, but it will change how you think about God's church. When things go badly, God's got it. He will repair, protect, redeem. And when things go well, God did it. He gets the glory and the honor and the praise. Knowing who has the church, knowing who the church belongs to, It'll change you. Here's the last thing it does to me when I know who the church belongs to. Is it challenges me to action. One of the most important verses of my life is, Romans, is 1 Corinthians 15, 58. In that context, Paul has been talking about resurrection. And, and how the resurrection changes how we live today. And at the end of that chapter, he says this, Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Give yourself fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is never in vain. And there's a lot to that verse. How we can stand firm in light of the resurrection. There's a lot to unpack there. But I just want to focus on one little thing uh, that will change how you think about the church. Your labor in the Lord is never in vain. And if that's true, and if the church is about Jesus and for Jesus, and if the church belongs to Jesus then that means that the work we do on behalf of the church is always eternally significant. This realization was a huge part of my own call to ministry. I felt like I had a lot of things I could do, and I wanted to do something that I knew was important, and I got a hold of this text, and I was like, well, 
if I tried to serve the church, I would never have to wonder. But it's not just about people who choose to go into the ministry. It's about all the ways that you decide to serve God's church. The investment you make to prepare a lesson or to reach out to a friend. Good grief. In December, you all probably figured out that that Christmas Eve was a, a roller coaster this year at this church. We did a different thing every day. It was crazy. Like, I, I don't even quite like to go into it because I haven't gotten a chance to talk to my therapist yet about it, and I'm worried I'll start crying on you. It was crazy. But among the things that happened at, for Christmas Eve was we had this crew of workers that showed up on Monday to set everything up, and then a storm was coming, so we had to tear it back down. And then on Tuesday, they set it all up. It got to stay up Tuesday night, but then on Wednesday, we had to tear it all down because we thought a storm was coming, a storm that did not come. So we had to get about half of it back out. But, of course, that night, we had to tear it all down again. And then Thursday, we set back up for a different program, which halfway through, we had to cancel because the blizzard came, so we had to tear it all down. And it was about the same 14 people that set it up and tore it down and set it up and tore it down and set it up and tore it down. I'm actually not sure whether in the end we left it up or left it down. I don't know. And it's so easy when you're in the middle of that to think this is all wasted. This is all, you know, all that energy we did setting things up was all wasted. And I know it because we had to tear it back down the next day. And if the church didn't belong to Jesus, you might be right. You might be right. If the church didn't belong to Jesus, you might be right. You would have to use the means of the world to measure whether all that energy was worth it or not. But the church does belong to Jesus. And our labor in the Lord is never in vain, which means that our work and service on behalf of God's church, even when it doesn't work out the way we'd hope, even when doesn't, we, you know, we, can't, we don't see the victory, even then... It is never in vain. It's never wasted. Because the church belongs to Jesus. I love reading these stories about the history of our church. One of the things I love about them is reading about people that I'd otherwise never hear of. Why do I know the name William H. Young? I mean, his great-great-grandpa, well, he was a Revolutionary War hero. I suppose we'd know his name. But William, that's actually the name I know. Why do I know his name? Well, it's because on November 12th, 1871, he opened his house to what really amounts to a small group Bible study. Fifteen people. They read the first chapter of the book of Acts together. They took communion. They had dinner. And they prayed. But his labor in the Lord is never in vain. The story of this church is our story. And I hope you come to believe that it is your story, that you're a part of it. And you get to help write the next chapter. But before we we kind of wrap our heads around the fact that it's our story and it's your story, we've got to know that it is God's story. That God is authoring the story of his church and inviting us to be a part of it. This is why for me, I'll just, you know, it's funny, writing this sermon in the middle of this week has been a real challenge for me. Because I want to get distracted by all the politics and all the arguing and all the fighting and all the chaos. And I really do think that stuff matters. And I am worried that people are listening to nonsense and believing lies and letting it corrupt their hearts. But this is the story God's writing. Jesus didn't found America. He did found the church. This is the labor that is never in vain. And everything we just said about the church is true about your life. Yes, your life is your story. Of course, you already knew that. Your life is your story. But your life also is meant to be God's story. 
Romans 14, none of us live our lives to ourselves alone. None of us die to ourselves alone. If we live, we live for the Lord. If we die, we die for the Lord. Whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. Everything we just said about the church belonging to Christ is meant to be true of you if you are in Christ. This is why Jesus says the first and greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Because you belong to God. And so the first command is to love God. And for 150 years, that command has been where this church has started. Knowing that we belong to God as a church, knowing that we ourselves belong to God, we start here. People always want to know when you, they find out you're a pastor, they'll say, so what's your church like? And that's, you know, a tricky question to answer. Do they want a church history lesson? You know, what, what do they want to know? But lately, I've started with the, the answer uh, that we actually, it's actually the one that we put on our website. Here's what our church is like. We're, we're trying to follow Jesus by loving God and loving everyone and making disciples and telling our stories. That, that's the answer we give. If you want to hear all about the details of that answer, uh, come to the next uh, First Things First class. We'll tell you all about our church and how those four ideas drive everything we do. And over the next few weeks, we're going to talk about how those four ideas have been driving everything we do since the very beginning, 150 years. But the place it starts is with God. Listen, a lot of things have changed about this church in 150 years. We've changed locations about uh, a little less than a dozen times. We've changed pastors a little less than two dozen times. Not a single person is alive today who was there in that room with William H. Young in 1871. We've grown some and shrunk some and grown again and shrunk again and grown again and shrunk again and grown again and shrunk again. Lots changed in 150 years. But two things haven't. This church belongs to Jesus Christ because every church, the church belongs to Jesus Christ and our first commandment as a church and as followers is to love our God the very one to whom we our very lives belong This is your story. Let's pray. Gracious God, we want our story to be the story of a people who love you. Teach us now, God, to give you our full and complete love. Teach us, God, to love you first and to serve you alone. Protect us as a church from all the things that would tempt us away from your love. Likewise, protect us as your people. God, we thank you for the legacy we have as part of this church, a legacy of faithfulness and commitment to you, a church that is founded by Christ and is about Christ and for Christ and belongs to Christ. And we pray that as the next chapters of our story were written, you would preserve that truth. We pray this in Jesus' name.